rabbit here. So anyway, today we're going to have a little look at um, a processor, and specifically the um, Motorola 68000, which is used in quite a few Amiga versions. And um, specifically, we're going to be focusing on the interfacing. I mean, how does the processor communicate with the external world, and what is the processor anyway? In any case, so let's take a look at that. So here's the um, 680000 processor, and um, it's pretty much the clean, cleanest representation of a processor. So you have all these individual pins to communicate with the external world, and then you just put this in a socket, and then it communicates with the rest of the Amiga system. Here's another processor in the same generation, 608040. Um, as you see, it has a different packaging type, back, and then it has a totally different pinout solution. But the, basically, the way it communicates with the external world is pretty much identical to the original 68000. So, let's take a look at a little bit more modern solution, and I'm just going to generalize. So, these are you know, what one usually deals with as a maker, one has a system on a chip solution, so um, basically the processor is not visible in physically in any meaning that you could actually identify or, or measure. So <laughs> the processor is just one of the, is embedded in one of the chips under this, under this um, protection um, shield. And um, all the all the signaling that is done is done internally inside the system on the chip solution. Uh, you, never, you never you never see them. So for 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 people that deal with more modern modern gear, the, if you're not dealing with a like PC technology uh, as such, then then the processor is in it's, a, it's an embedded solution and you know you never see the signaling that the processor does and, or actually need to understand it when you go back to the 80s then it's um, in the Amiga framework then then it's actually the processor is its own physical unit with its own um, pins to communicate with the rest of the chips and then also the where it gets even more complicated for the modern in the modern world is that you can have like this here is a uh, field programmable gate array so um, this has lots and lots and lots of different pins and basically if you don't know the solution that's that's been programmed into this chip uh, you have no idea basically what those pins are doing how are they inputs are they outputs are they what <laughs> there's only certain dedicated pins for power and clock and stuff that are, that are of course identifiable Generally speaking, you <coughs> the solution you load into this de uh, defines what this does, uh, including to the extent that does this chip actually contain a processor functionality. So in in the um, uh, yeah in FPGAs, you basically if you want a processor, then then you program in the processor into the chip. And you can actually do that with them. You can actually add more than one, depending on how how large the FPGA is in terms of resources. Then you can even put in multiple processors. But again, the the signaling is never exposed, so you you don't see the um, processor signaling, other than the in the de you know if you're debugging FPGA, of course, then you can see it. But if you're just generally, there's no way to measure or see the signaling the processor does. So anyway, to put the processor in some kind of a context, let's have a look at the first uh, the Omega hardware reference manual. So we'll just have a quick look at the architectural, general architectural description around Omega. So basically, and here you see the um, 68000 and it identifies its own unit. And then it has to be able to, uh, interesting for us that it has to use its pins I just displayed to be able to communicate with uh, in the case of the Amiga 2000, the expansion connector, and then for all general Amigas, it needs to communicate with the general I.O. circuits. It needs to be able to access the um, system memory, 
and um, it needs to be able to use to read the um, system ROM and then it needs to also interact and communicate in a bi-directional fashion with the um, custom <coughs> chip solution including where there's a, uh, a, a um, like a secondary processor which also needs to be able to like uh, access the um, communication bus so um, let's have a look at some further details so here's a little bit more specific um, diagram this is an Omega 500 plus diagram and it shows a little bit in a little bit more detail but, um, where, where you can actually see how the address bus connects to the different components and how the data bus flows and then it has these um, different um, specialized pins that are used to communicate certain states of certain control functions so as you see here it's already we're starting to define like why, why would we be interested in the pins on a on a 68000 processor because those are the only way that it can communicate with the other um, system components and we also have the same in the Commodore Amiga 500 2000 technical reference manual so you have the system box diagrams you can see the, see the uh, role of the processor in controlling different aspects of the, of the system And then we have the final list uh, going down into the nitty gritty details. Then we have um, the actual Amiga 2000 um, schematic diagram for the connection of the processor. So here we see um, both the incoming and outgoing control signals and the address bus and the data bus. So, what I thought I'd do is to just yeah, quickly or quickly, but uh, just to. Um, start from the groupings of these signals and just have it a little bit of an overview and a discussion of what what are the um, signals or what are the pins and what are they used for on a generalized basis and then of course you can always access the like Motorola technical reference manuals and stuff to dig out the timing the actual timing um, stuff which I won't be going into too much here so so, but I mean, uh, once once I give you this, then you get a bit better understanding. Of, Aha! That's what the computer processor can communicate and can't communicate, and then you have a little bit more better understanding of the of the um, yeah the processor's role in and, and how does it communicate with the with the rest of the system. So let's start looking at the pins. And as I said before, these are grouped like logically, so there's not like start from pin 1 and then and the last one there. so anyway um, as I discussed before I've mentioned before that the 68000 processor is actually capable of supporting multi-processor functionality so that it can actually coexist on the same bus with other pro other processors in the case of an Omega it's a co-processor that it interfaces with but it can also handle um, like math co-processors or you can put another 68000 in parallel so here it has the um, uh, a bus request pin, so that an external chip can request to have access to the bus, and then after a while, um, that the uh, a bus grant will be issued. So that pin activates, and this when we're talking activation, then you need to look at it. You know, have to like look at the documentation and see what is active you know is it usually it's logical one but it can also be zero so you have to be a bit careful with that uh, and then you have um, bus grant acknowledge so that that comes in from the external ship saying that okay yep no I accept the uh, bus grant so with these pins it handles this um, like cycling between the you know, like you know, another processor takes over and there's usually there it can be external logic connected to this which is separate from the processors to synchronize this activity like you can do time slicing and all, all, all kinds of different approaches or interrupt driven um, you know bus transfers like if you have an IO processor and then you have a main processor that can wake up the IO processor when there's an IO inter ah. well we won't go and get into that that's to, to do with the external circuitry and then you have a, a bus error pin 
and then uh, that an external device can indicate that there's a bus error and then we have a clock pin and this is th this is the the thing that synchronizes all activities to, towards external entities so you have a, a, cl a TTL clock and every, everything if you look at the timing diagrams and everything it's it's tied to the um, main clock input uh, and it um, has the enable pin. So this is like pro because the the way they built is they they built the six eight hundred series family of like uh, peripheral um, chips, and they had a certain logic or uh, digital logic how how they how you interface with them. So what they did is they carried over that. Um, logic and pin out uh, uh, pin functionality over to the 68000 <laughs> so if you know, want to know more about that then I suggest you read the documentation but the, the idea being that they wouldn't have to redo all the <laughs> IO chips they created just to uh, so they, they moved the processor to 68000 architecture to that level and then they kept the uh, they wanted to still use all the uh, 68000 hundred family peripheral chips and to be able to do that then they had to like yeah include this for example this enable pin uh, and then we have interrupt control Yeah, so this is the, so if you look at any 68000 design, there's usually like, uh, when it comes to per interrupt management, there's usually like the generate, the interrupt generating um, source, which goes to a interrupt controller or arbitrator of some one kind or another, either hard coded TTL or more advanced features. And then that actually gets sent to the processor to say, okay, the, the, this interrupt level um, has been requested. Okay, and then we have uh, yeah, processor function codes. This is uh, yeah, I think this is. I haven't really seen this used so much, but I mean, it it communicates, it tells the external wo world what mode the um, uh, processor is um, executing. Is it user or supervisor? And that that can um, that can actually uh, be fed into memory management uh, logic that then, for example, maps in different um, memory regions depending on if, it, if you're running in supervisor mode or user mode. So that kind of like memory, uh, hardware based memory protection before, because this, this processor has no memory management unit, so it, it's, it's basically totally incapable of protecting its memory access. For <laughs> so, so then they usually, they could take this logic and combine it with a memory with an external um, entity that then um, yeah handles memory and tries to provide a protected supervisor memory error. Uh, so and then it has a uh, data transfer acknowledged because when you when you're transferring data to memory and stuff, it, it, it's not. Um, things don't happen instantaneous there's always a delay and um, in some cases if you have an IO chip or something then it can be that uh, so the processor needs this okay when when did the actual data transfer complete so that then it can move on with its other internal activities And here again is this uh, compatibility with the uh, legacy IO in the in those. Yeah, we're talking 1980. <laughs> we're talking prior to 68000 processor uh, 
peripheral device. Um, so then it actually says that there's a, a, a valid memory address for memory mapped 6800 um, series uh, IO chips. Yeah, and then this is an input to valid peripheral address so that actually they work together. So, um, yeah, uh, and that's to do with the handshaking for the 68000 because uh, all the 68000 um, peripherals they're mapped into memory. <laughs> address strobe, so then, and this is to do with also the issue that. that nothing is instantaneous, so if it's establishing a new address on the address bus, then it needs to actually communicate, okay, when is the, when is, in, in uh, the processor needs to tell the world, okay, now, now there's a valid address, so, so that the external circuitry doesn't start working on addresses that are in the transition period, or randomly read the address bus, so that, and then, um, uh, uh, then of course, then the d when X comes to the data bus, then it needs to say, is it like writing data or is it reading data? And upper and lower data strobes. Ah, because you had this, uh, this is actually the uh, communication pin so that you could actually have it running in 8-bit mode. Don't know if I've seen this in news either. But it, it is that you could reduce the data bus down to 8 bits. So then you say that, okay, now, now I have, now uh, you have the lower 8 bits of the data, now I have, now the um, upper 8 bits of the data is, is active. But I'm, Amiga doesn't use that. Uh, reset, of course, is you know, can reset the processor. And then the processor will go th through a certain sequence and it will do certain things when it's reset. So, so you have to have the uh, external hardware has to be prepared, prepared for the um, has to also know and be prepared for the reset. So often this reset pin go uh, reset signal goes to several devices at the same time. And then halt is that you can stop the processor. And then we have the address bus. In this case, it's 23 um, lines that are dedicated to defining the address. And this is unidirectional, so it's always output. But it's a three-state bus, so you can actually, the processor can, when it relinquishes the bus, then it, it gives up the address line, so it doesn't try and drive the state. I haven't been too much talking about the this one here, but there's a, there is a uh, like a defined state what happens when the um, CPU is reset. So that um, hardware designers can actually deal with the fact that okay, oh now out of the blue there was a reset action, and then um, the hardware designers can compensate for the fact that, uh, that what state the um, the different control signals can be in. In, uh, during a reset cycle. And then you have the bus, and that's 16 bits. As I said, then there was the option to run it in this, or, yeah, slight, well, not odd, but the, 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 you could run it in a 8 bit mode. And also, that the, the, it could be that. I must say, I didn't read up on that. But when it's accessing the 6800 I.O. devices, I think that there might be a... Could be situations when it's using that um, mode switch. But uh, as I said, I suppose that uh, might be dependent on, the har on how the hardware is designed. That the processor sits in. Oh, and then I just made a general pinout. So um, some of the locations of the... 
Yeah, I mean the groupings are quite sane. So in in close proximity pins, you usually have the groupings like here. You have the internet, uh, the interrupt grouping, and then the bus control logic and upper lower and uh, and then um, address lines and data lines are grouped. So it's yeah, quite sane actually. So anyway, that was the overview of the um, six eight thousand um, pin functionality, and um, it's interesting because this is the way, this is the only way the processor can communicate with the external world. So it, if if this sequencing is not understood or uh, or doesn't work, then um, <laughs> odd, odd things happen. So it's. Uh, it's actually quite important uh, when you're do dealing with the retro equipment, I mean, like the Omega series and stuff, that you have some kind of a... I mean, this is a by far not a, not a, a deep a deep dive, even if some people might consider it, though. Um, but, I mean, if you... Yeah, there are several layers of details after this description. Uh, but at least this, gi this gives you the starting point that you, you understand that the processor... Um, it's a, a unique identity chip. It has its own um, pins, and it's the only those pins it can use to communicate with peripheral devices or with the Amiga core processor. Or, and and then, um, if you've been following the channel, I've been a bit covering um, Motorola assembler, and then you have maybe a bit of un understanding because when you're working on the assembler level, then uh, each assembler instruction if it if it has an external impact then it will go through this bus cycling to be able to realize the um, memory accesses or io chip accesses or interaction with the um, amiga co-processor processor oh i think we call it a day on that one and um if you're interested in this kind of tech then stay tuned and i'll see you in the next one